Okay, thank you very much for a nice introduction, and thank you very much for inviting me for this beautiful place, a nice school. And yeah, it's winter in California. I don't, I don't complain about California weather, but it's very nice to actually feel summer during the uh, winter. So I'm Yong Soo Yang, and I'm working as a postdoc in Coherent Imaging Group in Department of Physics in UCLA, and, and I'm working with Professor Miao. So our group mainly works with two different things. One is coherent diffraction imaging, and another one is atomic resolution electron tomography. So let me briefly explain these two completely different looking things, but they are actually related. So coherent diffraction imaging is like also known for lensless imaging. So if we're usually imaging in very high resolution, you need very big lens. You like make larger and larger lens to collect more the, the, the wave vectors to get higher resolution. But now the computer is getting more and more powerful. And John, our, my advisor, actually in 1999, showed that using computer without lens, you just collect the diffraction pattern. And using computer, you just phase. You get phase information back. And then you get very high resolution image without lens. This is lensless imaging. And this one is actually based on the missing data retrieval. retrieval. So usual diffraction pattern measured, we cannot measure the phase information. We have only magnitude. So this is usual diffraction pattern only with magnitude. And if you have some sample, this diffraction pattern fine enough, by using some iterative method with correct constraints, we can get the phase information back. And then we get the high resolution object by just inverse Fourier transform. So atomic resolution electron tomography, this is a completely different one. This current imaging is usually done by x-ray. This one is electron the microscopy. But same principle here. Electron tomography, we have to take the test series. But our sample usually easily get damaged by electron dose. So we cannot get as many, many projections. We have to min minimize the number of projections we get for the getting the tomography tilt series. So, so as a result, we get a lot of missing data during the tomographic tilt series measurement. And how well we can get the missing data actually determines how well we can get the 3D object back. So I'm mainly focusing on this atomic resolution electron tomography for my postdoc project. And yeah, the more details will come tomorrow. But anyway, both, both uh, technique actually shares the same problem, how to get the missing data as accurate as possible. So for my talk for today, I will talk about the basic tomography principles. This one is just basic tomography. It works for, it, this principle works for every tomography, like CT, computed tomography, or like MRI, or all kind of different tomography works in the same principle. And after introducing these tomography principles, I will also introduce something more focused about electron tomography. So more specific electron tomography will be later in today's session, and tomorrow, I will introduce some more recent work about our atomic resolution 3D electron tomography. So let's start. So what is tomography? Tomography is a method which actually higher dimensional structure can be obtained from lower dimensional projections, usually by like sampling structure from many different directions. You just tilt sample or tilt the source and detector to get different images from different directions and reconstruct the object back from that projection, which is a lower dimensional. So depending on the source, the type of, there are many different types of tomography. When, you use, when we use x-ray, we usually call it CT, computed tomography. This is very like, commonly used in medical diagnosis nowadays. And also like radio frequency wave, when MRI actually uses this radio frequency wave from the magnetic response to get 3D structure back. And this electron, today's topic, when you use electron for a source for imaging, we call it electron tomography or 3D TEM. Or there are another technique like ions. We just like using the electric field, we just from surface, we eject atoms and detect the detector to get the location and atomic species. So we call that technique atom probe. That's also like some sort of tomography technique to get 3D information from the lower dimensional projection. So why we care about tomography? This is a very famous picture. Probably some of you know the answer. But this is usually people show 
to explain why 3D information is important. So here's some object. So we want to figure out what is in here. So somebody shine the light from here to project it on the screen. So can you guess what will be this object? This hand, right? Yeah. When I first look at this, yeah, I thought the same thing. It will be hand. But in reality, it's a rabbit. <laughs> by using, by just looking at this one. Probably nobody can imagine something in between is like this. <laughs> Rabbit with two hands, two ears, and one leg. <laughs> that making hands like, like projections. So this just 2D projections can be easily misleading. By only using this one, you cannot get true structure of this 3D object. One more example, like more related to like similar to electron microscope. This is the, like, let's guess, this, let's just assume that this is the, the electron microscopy for TEM projection image to one direction. It looks like there are four different objects, red, some, with some like sawtooth type of the surface, and yellow one, and green one, and very small dot. But we don't have any depth information about this object. So when you look at this from side, it may look like this, this one, Looks, looks like some sphere, but when you look at from side, this is actually a very flat disk. But this yellow one and this green one are actually sphere. And the depth information is different. This is lower, this is higher. Or, same projection can be obtained from this kind of different object. This one, the depth is different. In this case, this one is flat and this one is like spherical. Or this one, both are flat and this, actually these two are in the same depth. So without looking at this side, we, can, we cannot get the depth information of this one, not true information. Very experienced microscopists, microscopists may be able to do that by just some tuning defocus and figure out the depth information, but that's really difficult, especially when this, the, the depth difference is very small. So we need tomography to exactly get the 3D structures. So let me introduce a brief history of tomography. So 1917, <laughs> Radon actually developed a Radon transform. That's actually a transform which relates high, higher dimensional objects with lower dimensional projection. I will explain more detail in the later slides. And of a lot of years later, like 50 years later, the, this Bracewell and Riddle developed the image reconstruction method, like filter back projection. This also will be explained in later slides to invert fan beam scan from radio astronomy. So you, like in the beginning, actually this tomography was developed by astronomers because like astronomical like objects actually if rotate around, they evolve, like rotate. And actual each, when, I look, when we look at sky, each projection of sky is actually different projections with the rotating objects. So by reconstructing this one, you can get the 3D information of our like universe. So this was what initially uh, developed by the astronomers. And later, 1968, uh, some people de demonstrated electron tomography for the biological samples. And the most famous one, the CT scanner, was developed by Hounsfield in 1972. And also Cormac developed the mathematical basis for the CT. So, tomography, so let's Let's explain more of the tomography. So this one, we have three dots. So when you project this one in this direction, you get these three peaks here. And when you project this one and this one, this direction, this direction, you get same thing, three different <coughs> peaks. But the, space, the spacing between these objects are slightly reduced. But in different case, we also have three dots. But in this case, they are in, not in the same depth. These two are closer to the screen. In this case, this direction projection remains the same, just three, same thing with this one. But when you project in different directions, actually the, the, the objects, the projection in the middle actually shifts in this direction for this projection, shifts in this direction for this projection. If this one is in different depth from the, the other two, then the, the amount of shift will be also different. So each tilt actually tells a little more 
about the shape and distribution of our sample. So this one, just looking at this projection, we cannot distinguish this, this and this. But by looking at more and more projections, we get more information. But this is still indirect. We, we want to get the 3D, the entire whole structure from just reconstruction, not just like tilting a little bit and see and just guess what will be the object, something like that. So how can you get the projection? And how can you get the higher dimensional, ob dimensional object back from projection? That's the upcoming slide series. So let me just expl explain about projection first. So let's say an object's density, or I'm saying density here, but any other physical properties can be possible for projection, like electric potential, or like in, case, in MRI, the magnetic response. Anything which can be projected can be projected. Like, for example, this F is a function of density for in this case. And projection is actually similar to just summation along just given direction. So for zero degree projection, I just sum, sum every this, sum this F function F along the Z direction, so like this. So that's zero degree projection, P0. And at angle theta, we can get theta angle projection like this along, so just summing, summing this function f along this direction. And you get 2D projections. So we have two like coordinate u and v, and this is 2D. And this f is three-dimensional object. Same thing in here. So projection 2D, 2D projection can be obtained from f depending on the angles. So here comes the radon transform. So radon transform actually relates the original object, 2D or 3D or even higher dimensional object, to lower dimensional object. So this one, our initial object is in x, y plane. So each coordinate and x, the, the dot at x and y represents the density or some physical property of this object. Radon transform transforms this entire object into one projection. For example, for angle theta, the projection of the, this object in theta direction is the summation along this direction. And this one, this pro, in projection space, that's, so in this object space, this is x and y coordinate. And this projection space, that's radon space, it's the variables are, the objects are defined in theta and r. So 2D object, transformed to 2D objects with theta and r. So let me give more specific example. So this is mathematical thing is a little bit, can be confusing. So this is a real example. So here's our object, the sphere in some location. So when you take one projection along this direction, let's say this is zero degree projection, then we will get something like this shape signal at zero degree. This is the si sinogram this is the radon transform of this object. This one actually represents, this one is the angle, and this one is the r, so the, the location from the center, the distance from the center. So for zero degree, actually this projection is like this. So from left side from the origin, there will be peak, and that is this line. You see, here will be peak, here. So this, this one line here actually represents the one projection here. And we can go to 45 degree project. We can make 45 degree projection. And when we project this one back, then you will see the projection will be slightly left from the origin in this case. So that's the 45 degree. When the angle is 45 degree, the projection is moved slightly closer to the origin. So that's this projection. Same thing for this projection. When you project in 90 degree, like this, the projection will happen exactly at the origin that's here. And similarly, like 180 degree projection will be here. So this is, so taking radon transform of this object is actually getting this sinogram that is actually the set of projections of each angle. So radon, radon transform of this one, this one. So this is a more specific example. So, so this is very easy object. So when the object becomes more complicated like this, let me show you the 
would be so in zero degree case so zero degree case when you project along this direction there will be three peaks like this and that's here zero degree you see three peaks here one two three and when you move this guy in 45 degree then when you project this one this direction you will see very high peak here and like relatively weaker peak here so that's the minus 45 degree projection so here you, you see this section is high intensity here and low intensity here and same thing so you can see what how this guy rotates around so understanding this sinogram is very important so this is called sinogram because it looks like this is sinusoidal shape like sine curve when this is projected in the entire the 180 degree projections so this is radon transform so we get sinogram from the original object by just projection so what we want is how can you get this original object back from this radon trans transform this set of the object we have all the projections so now how can you get this original object back that's the next important question before going to that actually this radon transform is related to Fourier transform so let me explain that one first because that's really important so this one you all know this Fourier transform relation and Fourier transform actually destructs the real space object with the a lot of spatial frequency sine wave or like exponential forms and cosine and sine components. And depending on situation, working in free space makes life much easier than working in real space. For example, like Shannon's sampling theorem, this is a very famous one. So when there's like initially computers are initially developed, people try to digitize some signal and send this one like very accurately to somebody else. So there's the signal is originally analog, so it is continuous. To send this signal accurately, as accurately as possible to somebody else after digitizing, people will think just make this one, this section very fine, sample very finely and send, then that will be more accurate. But actually Shannon figured out that if the signal is band limited, if there is the, the free frequencies are limited, within the limited bandwidth actually finite sampling in free space can send this signal without any error so this one can be sent only with the finite sampling without loss of information that's the Shannon sampling theorem for example this one very easy case this is a sine wave I don't need to just like section this out to send this information back I just give them this is this frequency this is some amplitude then the receiver can just reconstruct this signal by using that frequency and amplitude. And one more inform imp important information, phase. So if we don't give phase, you don't know which one is which. This, the same amplitude and frequency, it can be this one, or this one, or this one. This phase looks like less important than this one because it just shifts. The same things are shifting around. But actually, phase is very important. So we have to be very careful about dealing with phase when you do the tomography or any kind of like Fourier transform, Fourier space analysis. So let me show you a quick example how important the phase is. So here's the like two very great institution logo. One is UCLA here. One is the Brazilian uh, nanotechnology laboratory. So this one is actually real space image. So this is real no complex real real numbers real image i made it this is originally colorful i made it but grayscale so easier scaling so i can if i free transform this real object actually in free space it's complex number so it has magnitude this is a magnitude of the free transform of this object and this is phase same thing i free transform this one this is magnitude and this is phase so let's swap magnitude and phase of these images here so I use this magnitude and this phase, combine these two, no, this magnitude and this phase, combine these two and inverse Fourier transform. And combine these two, 
this magnitude from this number, this image, and phase from this image, combine these two and Fourier transform. And what will happen? This is what happened. So I took the magnitude of this one, but phase of this one. It's not perfect, I, but I'm getting something like this one, right? And this one, same thing. Phase from this one, magnitude from this one. Not exactly, I, this is still like a lot of artifacts and not clear, but still I'm getting most of the information from here. I can recognize the object. So phase is actually much more important than magnitude in this case. So we have to be careful, so phase. Is very important. So let's go to the Fourier slice theorem. This is actually what relates to the relates the radon transform and the Fourier transform. This is a very important theorem. So if you understand this Fourier slice theorem during today's lecture, that's already very like good. You, you whenever you do deal with the electron tomography or any kind of tomography, once you understand this one, it makes life much easier. So projection of object is equivalent to a central slice of objects. Fourier transform at the viewing angle. What this means is projection is summation along one direction. So projection, I'm projecting along this direction. So I got the summation. This is projection, summation along this direction. Summation along one direction is actually slicing. So one line through origin. One slicing through origin along the same angle, these are equivalent. So you just summation along this direction, you get projection, and Fourier transform. Then, if you Fourier transform this one, you exactly get the one section of this Fourier space. And same thing, when you rotate the object, this Fourier space section will also rotate. And this is just a 2D example, and 3D, same thing. Three objects, when you project along this direction, you get projection. When you Fourier transform this object, you get like this Fourier space complex object. And when you slice through origin in the same projection angle, then you get one slice. This is called Fourier slice. And when you Fourier transform this Fourier slice, you get the real space pro the projection. And when you Fourier transform this real space projection, you get Fourier slice. So this is very useful in both, both directions. From reconstructing objects from projections, you use this direction. Fourier transform this one to get 3D object back in Fourier space, or you can Fourier transform this one and get slice and Fourier transform to get projection. So, a lot of very useful theorem. So now you know Fourier slice theorem. So this is the measuring projections. So taking radon transform, you get this sinogram. That's actually, this sinogram actually very, is equivalent with the Fourier space measured like this. So same Fourier space sample like this section is equivalent with the measured projections. So measuring tilt series projections means measuring like this radial lines in Fourier space. So we get this one. Now we know that in Fourier space, we obtained this object from the projection. By taking projections, we got this. So we have this Fourier space, so by just directly Fourier transforming, inverse Fourier transforming this Fourier space will give our original object back. That's the first question I have. Actually, that doesn't work very well. So actually, the acquisition, the each tilt series is actually in polar coordinate for each radial. But Fourier transform to faithfully define the, the Fourier transform between the discretized space Actually, it should be like Cartesian object. There is no true Fourier transform from this radial polar coordinate to the Cartesian coordinate. So we have to interpolate these measured projections into the Cartesian grid first before the trans Fourier transform. And that interpolation makes a lot of error in some cases. You saw this, the, the phase thing, right? In the Fourier space interpolation, you have to interpolate both magnitude and phase. And any error induced by this, like, induced from the interpolating phase will propagate and you get a lot of artifacts from the wrong phase. And also, there's a lot of missing data. I, in the electron tomography especially, you cannot measure a lot of projections due to the dose limit. So a lot of actual data points are missing. We don't know. 
unknown, non-determined. You cannot Fourier transform from a lot of non-determined points there. Because Fourier transform actually, to get one point at Fourier space, you get every point, you have, you have to sum up every point in real space and vice versa. To get one point in Fourier space, you have to sum up entire space in real space. So we have, to missing, we have missing data, so we cannot even Fourier transform. So I will explain later some new method can solve this problem. But right now, this doesn't work. So Fourier space actually not working in initial case. So why don't we do that in real space? There's very easy trick, back projection. So back projection is actually smearing each projection along the projection direction back. So how does it work? Let's say we have two projections from this object. For example, so like say one projection this direction, one projection this direction. So we'll have one curve here, one projection here. We just smear that projection back. So we project it along this direction. So let's try just back projecting the projection along the projection direction and see what happens. So one projection I smear it back, back project, and another projection I back project. So this is back projection from two projections. And doesn't look very similar to the original object, right? So let's try more. Let's try two more projections. So this projection and this projection. So four projections. Looks slightly better, but not quite. So let's go more. Eight projections. Oh no, this one looks slightly better, right? Come closer to this one. So let's go even further. 16 projections. 64 projections. And this is 128 projections. So after back projecting 128 projections, I'm getting more or less the shape of the object back. But are those look the same? Not quite, right? This one actually blurred. It's smearing out. Some intensity is smearing out. So just back projecting is not working very well. So let's, let's. So let's try. So let's say this is the known object. We have, we have two projections. So this is one projection. So F1, we have four unknown data points. Project along this direction, 12 and 8. Projecting along this direction, 11 and 9. So let's back project this direction first. So just put this projection everywhere. And back projection this direction. So just add this number here. And normalize. And actually, answer is this one. So this one, when you put here, you can see adding 5 and 7 for 6 plus 2, 8, 5 plus 6, 11, 7 plus 9, 9. So this should be the right answer. But by back projection, doing back projection, you don't quite get the right answer. So what's the problem? So there is something more rigorous mathematical proof. But actually, the problem is the sampling density. So this is our measured Fourier space. And you, when you see, like when you take this box, a lot of data points are here around the origin. If you take similar size box here, there are not many data points here. So higher frequency error is much less low, much less densely sampled compared to the near the origin. So low frequency information is much higher, much uh, higher sampling density. So this is problem. So this should be corrected to get the right answer. So we can think about the filter. So we have this problem. So actually, this sampling density decays as a function of 1 over r. So, one, so the distance from origin to this one is reciprocal of the distance from origin to sampling point is the actual the, the density uh, factor. We can just revert that by applying this cone filter. This is called cone filter because it looks like cone. So we just multiply this to this one. Then we can amplify this higher frequency information, and probably we can get this sampling problem corrected. So let's try that. So this is back project filter method. So I showed you back project each projection to obtain blurred object. I back project it and obtained blurred object. And then I Fourier transform 
explore the object. And in the free space, I apply this cone filter to amplify the high frequency information and then inverse Fourier transform to get the corrected object. So this is our original object. And this is back projection using 128 projections. And this is after filtering. So I Fourier transform this one, apply filter, and back project, the inverse Fourier transform. This one looks much better, right? Much closer to ob original object. But you may notice there is some like artifact here. There is very small white line here. And this is not very well visible here, but there is some inside, there is some ringing artifact here. So this back project, back project filter method have some drawbacks. Actually, this real space blurring, this one, is actually convolved with one over r function. And that one over r function goes infinitely. It does not, it's not in finite bandwidth. So it means to completely get this one over r project, r one over r uh, artifact removed, you need like infinitely fine sampling in free space, which is not possible. And also, we are amplifying high frequency uh, information in from the back projection. So a lot of like noise in high frequency noise will be greatly amplified if you have noise. In this case, it's a noiseless simulation. But in real life, this back projection filter method, noise will create create great problem. So is there a better way to do this filtering? So solution is we can filter before doing the back projection. So we measured individual projections. So I Fourier transform individual projections and apply this ramp filter. So this is just along one projection. I must just apply the same filter and back project using this filtered projection. So this is filtered back projection method or weighted back projection method. So it's a similar method, just apply the filter before back projection. So this is our original object. This is just regular back projection. This is a filtered back projection. And this one is reconstructed without artifacts nicely. So this is filtered back projection is the one technique very widely being used even nowadays for many uh, CT or even electron tomography uh, reconstruction. So there is one, so this is filtered back projection method. There is another method around. So actually brutal force reconstruction is also possible. For example, you have four unknown variables and projection along this direction is 12, eight, this F, F1 plus F4 is seven, F2 plus F4 is nine, F1 plus F3 is 11, F2 plus F3 is 13, like this. You obtain the projection. This is actually set of linear equations. So f1 plus f2 is 12. So we have six equations. And those set of equations can be represented as matrix. So this one. So this first row is like f1 plus f2 is 12. So this. So this matrix equation represents this set of the equations. And we can just recut, just multiplying inverse matrix of this one to here we can get this back. So this just direct calculation method like brutal force. But usually we have to deal with like 255 by 255 by 255, but a very big matrix. That one actually is not possible to do that in like reasonable amount of time. So another technique called algebraic reconstruction technique, ART, calculates this one, this linear, like, linear equation, solve this linear equation by iterative method. So make an initial guess of the solution by just back projection or filter back projection and compute projections ray by ray. So in the projections, to get the projection, I have to project along each rays like this. So for ray by ray, I calculate the projections and compare the projected point and so back projected point from the initial guess object and actual measured projection. And then if there's error, I update using from the difference, I can correct the initial guess object to make it more uh, closer to the original measured projection. So this is called, so we can just iterate, just continue updating, updating, updating this our object until you get perfect agreement between the back projection and the measured projection. 
So this is R. But this one actually suffer from salt and pepper noise a lot. Usually, we are doing lay, ray by ray and updating. And usually, if I correct this one ray, but the projection here has some noise, like salt and pepper noise. So somehow, this one is like have much higher intensity than it has to be. Then, the update function actually updates the object wrongly in the way, and the next projection will be affected by that wrong update. And all like later updates will be affected by that, that bad data point. So this one actually makes this convergence slower. And this is just showing the iterative process. We get the original projection from here, and I do the back projection and compare this back projection from the like object, each one, and update this object to get this back projection better matched with the original experimental projection. So this is the, the concept of, of the iterative process. So there is another algorithm, third. This one actually does a similar thing with art, but difference is art is doing the ray by ray method. This one, third algorithm does projection by projection method. So I do entire projection and entire back projection from the initial guest object and compare that with the major of the projection and update just everything averaged the weight vector. So this one actually updates our object in every projection by projection. So it's not very accurate update. So it takes very long time to actually get it converged to the right solution. So it requires lots of the iteration, but it's actually effective. So this is the usual Chef Logan Phantom. This is like usual uh, model objects we use to prove, like to show the, how good the reconstruction technique is. So we need to filter back projection with some missing data. For example, we have like we measured just on, up to plus minus 70 degree. So the projections from 70 to 90 degree is missing. Then we have some artifact here. So filter back projection cannot completely retrieve the information here. But if we use the, this third algorithm, actually it makes it better. So this is after like 20 iterations of the third algorithm. So by this updating, you, get, you can like remove this artifact and make this one better. So this one looks a little bit blurred, but it, it can solve this artifact problem. But its convergence is slow. So now a lot of people are using SART algorithm. This is simultaneous algebraic reconstruction technique. So this is just combines good things from ART and SART. So make initial guess and compute the back projection by ray by ray. So each ray will have different update uh, factor depending on the error between the back projection and the original major projection. And, but the difference is this one simultaneously update that update function for every projection. So it, the first ray error does not affect the next one. And actually different filters, additional constraints, like, like the, the, pro, the object should be real or should be positive, or a lot of different constraints can be also introduced during this algorithm. So this is very like, widely being used, and you can look this one for, if you're more interested in like, details like mathematics of this technique, because this is very complicated actually in reality. Okay, let's come back to the, the problem I initially stated. So this direct Fourier inversion doesn't work very well because of the interpolation problem, the Fourier interpolation and missing data problem. So if we can solve these two problems, actually then there will be a better way to determine this missing data and uh, get the better construction. Because in, if we can solve these two problems, then we get the Fourier transformable to object. So we can go back and forth, real space and Fourier space, and that one actually gives us a lot of advantage. So let's, so people were trying to solve this problem. And first, this interpolation problem can be solved by some, using this pseudo polar fast Fourier transform. So some mathematicians actually uh, developed this pseudo polar fast transform. So rather than just polar grid, so this is polar grid. Rather than this polar grid, we can define 
something similar to polar. You can see this, like, it looks like this measured projections line by line, but slightly different. You can see the distance between these two. So here, the spacing between data points are small. And for this projection, actually the spacing becomes larger. So this is actually a special grid. And if we use this special grid, there is a faithful Fourier transform, pseudo polar fast Fourier transform between Cartesian space and this pseudo polar space. But in this case, polar, usual polar grid, actually the angular spacing is constant. So we use like one degree, one degree, one degree, same angle step we measure projections. In this pseudo polar grid, it's not equal angle, equally sloped. So we get go equally like tangent theta, same tangent theta step, we just take different projections. When you take projections in this specific pseudo-polar angle, then we can do the direct Fourier transform without interpolation. So interpolation problem is solved. So next is missing data. So this missing data problem is already well known. A lot of people worked on, especially the diffraction field, because as I mentioned, diffraction pattern, when we measure diffraction pattern, we only get the magnitude. We, meet, we cannot measure the, the phase directly. A lot of people like use holography or different methods to get the phase, but just diffraction experiment, you cannot get the, you cannot get the phase. So actually, usually there is already developed iterative algorithm to get the phase back. So we can get the same method here. So we have measured data points. Those are the Fourier slices. So measured projections are the Fourier slices. But actually, in many cases, we know more information about our object. For example, usual the STEM ADF tomography. Our object, that's Z contrast, and our reconstructed object should be real and positive. You cannot get like complex objects from the ADF image because that's Z contrast and the atomic number cannot be negative or complex number. So we know that the reconstructed object should be real and positive. And there are some other, like the, it should have like atomic shape with some certain distance between atoms or it is confined within some size of volume or total varies. This is the real space constraint. Like uh, there should be like big sudden jump within the partially con the constant late array. So a different real space constraint can be used in this iteration. So in Fourier space, we use our measured data. These Fourier slices are measured data. We enforce measured data here. And pseudo polar Fourier transform, so this measured data is blue. When you pseudo polar Fourier transform, it is filled by some arbitrary number. And then we apply real space constraints. So it should be positive and it should be within like this size of box. Then we do the pseudo polar trans Fourier transform back again. Because we applied real space constraint, it changed our object entirely. Then our Fourier transform is also changed. So it may not be match with our measured Fourier slices. So we enforce this one again. So we put our Fourier slices, then this one becomes like that. There are some non-measured data points determined using this process, but we are still enforcing <coughs> measured data points. We just keep going and going and going until we satisfy both Fourier constraint and real space constraint. By doing that, we can retrieve this missing data point. All these green ones are initially missing, but during this iteration, we can retrieve this information. This is the iterative EST method. So EST is the equally sloped tomography using this uh, tomography using this pseudo polar angles and we can do that iteratively to get the missing data. So this is example. So using the iterative EST, we can get the missing data back. So this is simulated 2D nanoparticles. I just randomly put some atoms and with some random ziggles. And when you Fourier transform this one, you can see the peaks here. This is a lattice, so you see the lattice peaks in everywhere. 
when you do the filter back projection with the missing wedge, missing wedge means I don't measure the full the 180 degree. I measure only up to plus minus 10, 70 degree, and from 70 to 90 degree projections are missing. So this is our original object and or the Fourier transform, and this is a filter back projection from the projections with the missing wedge. And you can see here, this, this is the missing wedge. From 70 to 90 degree, we don't have information in Fourier space. This is not measured. And filter back projection cannot retrieve the data here. So you see peaks here. You can see everything recovered here. But here, this Fourier information is missing. And this one, you can see a lot of atoms are blurred and, and elongated along this missing wedge direction. This is usual artifact from the missing wedge problem. EST method, by, but if you if we try EST, we run the iterative process. Now you can see this should be missing wedge, this part and this part originally missing. But during the iterative process, you can see some informations are recovered. These high frequency ones are still missing. EST cannot recover 100%, but much better than just filter bank method. This is just empty, but at least we retrieved some information during the iteration, iterative process. So reconstruction review, let's quickly review what we learned. So back projection is real space of the operation, and it's just back projecting along the polar grid. Uh, sample, due to the sampling density, just back projection just blurs the original object. But you can apply filter to get the good projections back. But this, the back projection is good method, but you cannot get the missing data retrieved. So uh, people developed iterative techniques to get the missing data back. And equally sloped tomography EST technique for both the interpolation problem and missing data problem. So this usually gets very good reconstruction results. So, so far I explained about general tomography. So, so far I described works for any, like, like X-ray, CT, or any kind of tomography works. So let's move on to a specific electron tomography. So let's think about the projection requirement first. So to do the tomography, you should get good projections. So you have good projectors. So your instrument should produce like correct projections, which satisfy, satisfies that radon transform projection requirement. So projected intensity must be monotonic function of some property of the object, like mass or thickness or potential or other things can, use, can be used. And Beer's law usually dominates usual like tomography techniques. So uh, when the ray is propagating through the medium, it usually signal exponentially die uh, with the thickness and uh, uh, related to the scattering cross section. And when you take the logarithmic from here, you can get this thickness and the monotonic projection information can be obtained from the log of this ratio between original intensity and projected intensity. And TEMs are actually, in fact, uh, good projectors under certain conditions. For, like, for example, TEMs for biological objects in some relatively not very high, mag high magnification, actually, yeah, the contrast is like mass contrast. So it comes from the projection. It, we can assume that, that's, that there is a projection of the mass. And also ADF stem produces the incoherent Z contrast that's also like uh, satisfies this projection condition. So we can use the TM images for the, the, the tomography reconstruction. You have to be careful in some cases for TM, but yeah, I'll explain about it later. So I assume that you already learned about basics about the TM and stem last week, but just, just briefly. So usual conventional TM use lens to generate parallel beam in the sample, and the beam is uh, magnified by objective lens and detected using usually pixel detectors nowadays. So this is parallel beam, and you can measure the projections in like one second. Entire image can be Im imaged together. And usually this one is coherent inter interference imaging. And STEM, is using different condenser lens like formulation or even very different lens system for like very dedicated stem to focus very small size beam like angstrom or sub angstrom level to get the scattering here. 
we can both measure bright field and like annular dark field, but for the tomography, we usually measure this uh, annular dark field image or high annular dark field image. And this high angle scatterings are high just incoherent. These electrons in high angle lose all the, the coherence information. So incoherence imaging, this is actually good for the tomography purpose because this more closer to the linear. So STEM and TEM has all quantum pros. So STEM, like technologies are a little bit complicated and we have to raster the electron beam around the, the field of view. So the scanning actually takes a long time, like about 30 seconds. So if you don't have, if your stage is not stable or some prop, like, like if you cannot get very stable like object, then you have problems. The image will be all blurred. And it's sensitive to defocus. Aberration corrected stems, usually the depth of focus is a few nanometers. So if you're like away from the focus, like 10 nanometers, your, your object is already blurred. And a lot of contamination problem. Carbons, usually this beam induces carbon contamination very easily. A lot, usually it's a big problem. A lot, a lot of stem tomography case. But this is incoherent imaging method, just uh, linear projections. And you can get high contrast for high metal. Heavy materials, high Z materials, produces very high contrast. And we have no defocus problem. We actually have defocus problem depending on the instrument. But we have, if we have very good machine, like dynamic defocusing is possible, then we don't have defocus problem. And conventional TEM, just bright field TEM, it's common parallel illumination. So we don't have to wait 30 seconds. Just at once, you get entire image, single shot imaging and insensitive to defocus. So usually like for stem tomography, you have to like intentionally defocus a little bit to get rid of the, like get away from the CTF problem and anything. But still you get good like image, even with like defocus. And, but the problem is, this is usually coherent the imaging. So complex phase information can like make a lot of problems. For, for example, like crystals, if you image then if you like at the zone axis, the diffraction way make different contrast and when you rotate and if you're away from zone axis and those projections are like created from completely different mechanism and it doesn't satisfy the projection requirement. So this is problem. So usually this, the bright field TEM is widely used for the biological samples tomography and for material science, uh, we prefer the stem tomography. So we specifically for electron microscope, we have membrane. Usually our sample is on some grid and the thickness is here. So zero degree projections, thickness is like this. But at high angle, the mem when you project along this direction, the thickness is actually increased. So from zero degree projection and tilted object, this membrane thickness is different. So this one have different background and it produces some problems. Uh, with inverse cosine. So this is usual like thickness, thickness graph. And this one actually goes very highly like increase in higher than 70 degrees. That's why it becomes much more difficult to get the tilt series above 70 degrees. And this problem usually makes the missing wedge problem. Due to the sample geometry limitation like this one, thickness of the membrane or hardware. Sample holders also have some thickness. So it also gets in to the field of view in very high angle. So it becomes difficult to, it's really difficult to measure above some like 75 degrees. Even very dedicated tomography holder, which is very thin. So you have to be careful when you deal with, when you like hit something with the tomography holder, it easily bends, something like that. Even then you get very difficult time measuring higher than 75 degrees. So usually electron tomography have to deal with this missing wedge problem. We, have, we don't have data in this missing wedge. And also we have electron dose limit. So some samples can be easily damaged with even a small dose, like especially biological samples. So we have to do cryo EM in most cases for high resolution tomography. And cryo EM will be like more detailed. It, we yeah, it deals with more, in more detail by another speaker. I will not mention about it here. And material science samples are relatively sturdy, but still there's carbon contamination problem, knock on damage everywhere. So you have to minimize electron dose. And also that means minimize, minimize the number of projections and there's a lot of missing data. So you don't have, you cannot measure, 
completely feel this even measurable angle. And with less number of projections, the quality of the projection quickly degrades. This is usually a filter back projection. So like nice photo of Einstein. If you have 91 projections, you get the original object quite well. But with the like 61, 37, 25 projections, with less number of projections, when you try the filter back projection, you get much worse. Uh, result. So this is a problem. Another problem is, is alignment. So more than CT scanners, usually the object is fixed and the detector and source rotates around in fixed rotation axis. So there's not much alignment problem because it's guaranteed that the source and the measured images are rotated around the fixed rotation axis. But electron microscope, we don't have usually it's not reasonable to rotate the microscope and make the sample fixed. That's not reasonable. So we have to rotate the sample and usually we cannot exactly rotate the sample completely around like fixed, uh, very high resolution uh, rotation axis. So usually like this. Uh, during the rotation, the, when you rotate the tilt stage, the object moves a little bit. If you measure the projections at eccentric height, actually you can minimize the movement during the tilt series. But it, during the higher resolution measurement, you cannot get perfect eccentric height. And there's always movement around and stage drift and everything. So you have to align your measured projections before the running the reconstruction. And that's actually a very critical step. So there are many alignment methods. First one is cross correlation. A lot of like automatic softwares, usually like a lot, of, a lot of modern microscopes, comes with like automatic software for measuring tomographic tilt series, and they all, most of them use the cross correlation. So co cross correlation is basically convolution with uh, one object, uh, complex conjugated, and when you take the cross correlation of this one, and this one is just shifted along this direction, then you get sharp peak here. So, and this one, these two are identical images, then you get peak exactly at the origin. So from the shift of the sharp peak from the origin, from that distance, from that information, you can get the, how far away these two objects are. So from this information, you can align these two objects. And cross correlation alignments usually just angle by angle. So first, first projection you measured, and after tilting a little bit, you measure another one, do the cross correlation and align, and measure a third one, and cross correlation to the second one and align, fourth one align. So if you have wrong alignment during the tilt series, one projection all of a sudden missed due to some problem, then every angle after that is also wrong. So this is also like potentially very dangerous, so not very accurate method. Another method is using fiducial marker. Usually in the, like, especially biological samples, when you prepare the sample, you sprinkle some gold nanoparticles, usually like five, five nanometer diameter gold particles, you just sprinkle around and rotate. During the tilt series, it will look like this. This is not aligned one. So another aligned one like this. What you can see, these gold nanoparticles are moving. So you can trace those gold nanoparticles, and there is complicated algorithms. You can like calculate when, after rotating certain angle, the, the gold uh, gold nanoparticle should move like this. There are complicated algorithms. We can actually calculate those movements and and align using that like trajectory of the moving nanoparticles. And after alignment, this is after alignment. So you can see it's nicely aligned. And this is actually like porous material, and this is a reconstruction. This is a reconstruction. It's porous material, so a lot of holes. You can see holes inside this like tube-shaped one. So this one you cannot measure with just 2D projections. You, this is one case. You, do need 3D reconstruction to see where are the holes and what is the size. 
Another method is common line method. So this one is the tungsten tip. So this tip of some tungsten, uh, BCC tungsten wire. And this is also rotating around. So this is projection of this one along this direction. And this is projection along this direction. And during the tilt series, you can notice this single tilt. This one shape is a lot of change. The shape changes a lot, a lot of variation. But this one, I will show you. Why this one changes shape a lot? This one actually shape is the same. This is just moving, shifting up and down. But overall shape is, con is conserved. Because slices are the, so this is the tilt axis. And so I'm rotating like this around this axis. So slices perpendicular to this tilt axis, each slices are independent. So if I just cut this slice and reconstruct, then I get like full 2D information. They are not related to the, so projection along this direction is not related to the rotation. So projection along this direction, this one, so projection along, not along, projection perpendicular to the rotation axis, we call it, so this projection result, we call it common line, because all projections share this projection shape. So this is common to all projections, the common line. So we can at least align this projection along this direction using the common line. So this is actually just a diagram showing a lot of projections are measured in Fourier space but it all shares, it's like, it coincides in one line. This is the common line. So this is after aligning using the common line uh, for this one. So this one rotates, this one changing shape, but this one is staying the same. So common line after alignment, this is stationary. This is a simulation, and you don't get this perfect common line in your real case, but yeah. Good, after good common line alignment, this one should, all projections should show same common line. Very similar common line. And so this is single tilt axis case, just rotating along one axis. But in some complicated case, like if you have more than one tilt axis, then the projection will be like this, one, met, one projection like this, one like this, one like this. In this case, there's no single common line. There are many more, like number of common lines will increase, like add, 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 add. And actually this alignment is also possible, but the math is very complicated, but alignment can be done. And a lot of single particle reconstruction, this is also one branch of the electron tomography. It's not taking tilt axis, just the same particle, just you have one grid with a lot of identical particles, with different orientation and take the TM image and each particle, take each particle and find out the orientation and the reconstruction. So, so this single particle reconstruction uses this complicated common line approach a lot. But, yeah, mathematically is really what is very difficult. If you're interested, you can uh, look at this paper. And so common line alignment can make this one. So along this direction, it can be aligned. But what about along this direction? This direction is actually a problem. So this is one case. So you can see this is rotating like this. During the rotation, this one, this object moves. So it's like this, rotating like this. Like this, rotation axis is here. This one, Rotation axis is in the center. So it's like this. Both of these cases are actually aligned. So you can reconstruct this object back. But you don't know what the problem, this is after alignment, that's fine. But you don't have aligned data. You have to align your data to make either this or this or anyway. So you, you have to make your projection rotate along one common axis. That's actually complicated because there are a lot of possibilities and can be easily mixed up. And this is showing the problem. 
So this is one object. And this can be rotated along rotation axis one. It's here, like this. So zero degree projection will be like this, and 45 degree and 90 degree. And it can be also rotated along this rotation axis, like this. So how can you align like this projection? So this is rotating like this, so it's like moving around like this. And also during the measurements, during the due to the sta stage movement or the tilt axis, the wrong eccentric height, it will also jiggle around. So how can you get this alignment back? That's actually a problem. So one solution is there's one invariant point in every projection. That's center of mass. So you can calculate the center of mass of each projection. And that should be invariant, independent of the projection. So actually, if you can align, so these points are center of mass. So all different projections, you, you get the center of mass and make center of mass the same. So move the, the align every projection to make the center of mass in the same pixel, like this. This projection, this projection, this projection. So move this center of mass here. So this is center of mass alignment. And after center of mass, if you move your center of mass to the same common point along the rotation axis, then it should be aligned. So this is common, the common center of mass alignment method and works pretty well in high signal to noise ratio images like sampling or something. So this is center of mass aligned projections. So common lines, there's a common line very aligned, and this one actually is the common, the center of mass actually stays in the rotation axis. So there are several alignment strategies. So cross correlation, very simple to implement, and very fast and easy. And, but it can easily fail for complex object and not very accurate. And fusion, fusion particles, this one actually can do the sub-pixel alignment. And a lot of software like iMod or reconstruction software actually have good packages inside to do this uh, fusion markers alignment. If you know how to use the software, you can do that. And everything, letter, magnification, rotation, everything is in the calculation. So it finds out everything. Problem is it time consuming. You have to learn a lot. So steep learning curve. And in very high magnification, then this gold nanoparticle, like five nanometer, if you want to measure like five nanometer object, then you cannot use like gold nanoparticle, the same size object. And this is very difficult. You have to learn a lot because there's a lot of difficulties. Difficulties even preparing the sample. Like in the grid, are you going to put the nanoparticle first or sample first? Or are you going to put nanoparticle and sample in the same side or a different side? Everything matters in the reconstruction. Also, it depends on what sample you're looking at. So you need a lot of experience to like, like correctly do this method. Common line, very simple to implement. And it's also very fast to calculate. And sub-pixel accuracy there, but it only works for single tilt axis. So if you have multiple tilt axis, this common line method doesn't, method doesn't work. And in multi-axis case, it becomes very complicated. Center of mass, all good, simple, fast, sub-pixel accuracy, but you need high signal to noise ratio. If you have like very high background or some like very signal, very high noise, then that noise or background will actually dominate the center of mass, position of the center of mass. So your center of mass position cannot be accurately determined. It will be altered by all the other noise or other parameters. In this case, it goes of failure. So it only works for high signal to noise ratio. And we can further refine the projections, same thing, the iterative method. So after alignment, I have projection aligned initially and get the, the 3D object. And I can back project again and compare the original alignment came out from the back projection as well. So if most of them are aligned correctly, but one projection is slightly misaligned. In that case, after back projection, this object is correctly reconstructed from all the other projections. So when you back project, 
all the others will be very like very consistent with the measured projections, but one misaligned one will be different. So this like tiny, if one projection slightly misaligned can be identified by doing back projection and further refine. So this gives this like back projection method can even better alignment, but you have to start with good initial alignment. If initial alignment is bad, then this one will doesn't work because they will all like move around. So let's move on to tomography artifacts. So dealing with electron tomography, usually you see a lot of artifacts due to missing wedge or quality of the, the measured data or the alignment. So many problem actually comes from alignment. So let's see what kind of artifacts are there and how can you identify what the problem is. So this is the model structure. So three dots, three white circles. This is model. And let's first try what will be the missing wedge artifact. So I created the, back, the projections. I did radon transform, one degree angular step without missing wedge. And this is the reconstruction. It's perfect, right? If I don't have missing wedge with enough sampling, I get original object back, almost perfect. This one is missing wedge with uh, 40 degrees. So I measure plus or minus 70 degrees. So 40 degrees is not measured. You can see it from sinogram. So I don't have angles. So this one is minus 90 to 90. This one have only minus 70 to 70. So this is missing. And you can see these circles are elongated slightly along this missing wedge direction. If I even further increase the missing wedge, so in this case, I only have plus or minus 50 degrees. Then this one elongated a lot. And very extreme case, I measured only plus or minus 30 degrees. Then I'm missing a lot of projection. And this is the reconstruction. So compared to the original one, it's completely like artifacted and elongated along this direction. So missing wedge usually makes elongation along the missing wedge direction. And filter back projection actually makes this look worse. But if you use some iterative method, you can uh, get some information back. But if you, you're missing too much information, you cannot be completely iterized with problem. So this is typical missing wedge artifact. And you need high tilt axis to get proper object back. And this is 2D coarser structure. So like their coarser nanoparticles or something like that. I just simulated like binary. So in the center it's bright and slightly lighter material surrounding it and background. And this is the Fourier transform. And you can see here's sharp edges in our model. And sharp edge usually have to have very high frequency information. To make the sharp edge from the Fourier transform, you have to have a lot of like high frequency data points to create the sharp edge. So that's showing here. So along this sharp edge direction, you see high frequency peaks are in Fourier space. So when you reconstruct this one, this object using filter back projection with the missing wedge, 70 degrees. So this is the after reconstruction of the filter back projection. And you see this edge is still here. But this one is completely blurred. Because due to missing wedge, this one is in measured projection. But this one is completely missing. We don't have this one. So that's why this uh, edges are all blurred. But when you start from this rotated image, this one, actually in Fourier space, is like this. And this is missing wedge. So actually, this re required high frequency information is in the tilt theory. So depending on the original orientation of the object and what high frequency information is required, you get different reconstruction. This is the same number of projections, same missing wedge, but the quality of reconstruction completely different depending on the orientation relative with, with respect to the orientation, the rotation axis. So 
if it's possible during the experiment, you can even think about how to like orient your original sample to get the most uh, accurate reconstruction. And during the alignment, there's usually random error. Usually, a lot of project, the, the projections have noise. You cannot get noise-free images from the PEM. And due to noise, your alignment cannot be perfect. So the, like random ziggling here, the cyanogram, you can see it. It's not very smooth. There's some ziggling here. So I added intentionally random shift in the alignment of standard deviation 2 pixel. So that this one. This is original object. This is a reconstruction from this random error of two pixel standard deviation. This doesn't look very bad, right? Two pixel is fine. I increased to four pixel. This is original. This is reconstruction. You start to see more stronger artifact, and the surface is getting more blurred. So the, if alignment is getting worse, then you lose high resolution information first. So you quickly lose the sharp edge. Uh, you get more or less low resolution information fine, but sharp edge you quickly lose. So if you want something very high resolution reconstruction, you have to be very careful about the, the alignment. And this is eight pixel. You can see that the edge is even more blurred, and you see a lot of artifacts here. And cyanogram completely blurred. And sudden jump, I explained that the, the cross correlation alignment method usually like makes a lot of this sudden jump problem. One bad alignment, and after that, all the, the, all the projections measured after that will have the same error. And after jump, you can see like this, not circles, you can see like this boomerang shape in one direction, and another direction is like this cross tail. So this is usual artifact from sudden jump. And drift. You can see in the cyanogram, this actually should be straight line. The center circle, actually the rotation axis in the middle origin of the center circle. So this one should not move during the measurement. But if there is drift, this is also possible during for because of the inaccuracy of the cross correlation or other the stage drift or something like that. Uh, this is actually inclined along this direction. In this case, you can see like this heart shape. So this circle actually actually cut down this two direction and this direction actually like a little bit so curvature becomes lower in this direction and higher this direction like this and this is a shift two pixel shift per two degrees and this is like the drift toward the left different direction and you can see this just direction flips and this is the usual artifact shape from the drift And axis shift. Uh, so usually, a lot of tomography reconstruction softwares specifies where is the rotation axis in your image. So in most cases, it's the center pixel. In, in your image, your rotation axis should be aligned to the center pixel of the image. If that alignment is wrong, for example, you can see this center, this guy has shifted a little bit to this direction. In this case, you see this banana shaped artifact. Actually, this banana-shaped artifact is very, very, very commonly seen during the tomography reconstruction. Probably a lot of time, if you try some electron tomography reconstruction, you will see this banana thing. This is the wrong rotation axis uh, artifact. And if you shift the other direction, the, artifact, the banana will be along this direction. And this banana shape usually due to the rotation axis direction. So this is rotation axis, but if it's not well aligned the case, it should be like this. But if it's not well aligned, it will move along for different projections and like creating this one projection makes intensity here, one here, one here, and creating this banana shape. So let me summarize about the alignment and reconstruction. And alignment is very important to get very good 3D reconstruction. And reconstruction, you can, if you just randomly online anything and run the reconstruction software, then we'll give you something. It may not be correct, but getting something out from the software is easy. But making that 
correct object is difficult. And for that, you need very accurate alignment. And alignment is really difficult and tedious. It takes a lot of time, like a lot of like, trial, error. But it's very important. If you cannot get good alignment, you cannot get good objects, and you cannot do further analysis. And so depending on, so you know what artifacts will be there. So some artifacts is from this kind of misalignment and some artifacts from this kind of misalignment. So by looking at the reconstruction, you can see what is the problem and try to like, fix that problem a little bit faster. And there are more things to consider like noise. So denoising is like big branch in like applied math for signal processing. And a lot of like different noise denoising techniques are also known. And, and there are a lot of different sources of noise in like TEM image, but very simple model can be built like this. So image have this NE, this one is the true signal. This should be number of electron in the ADF detector. But you have Poisson noise because this is electron counting. You have shot noise and some multiplicative factor like amplification from the detector and Gaussian background noise. This is like simplest model you can imagine. And if using this simple model, you can run some sort of different uh, denoising technique to make your reconstruction better. So we actually get very good results by applying this BM3D denoising. This is well known very for very good denoising software. And I will explain further tomorrow for our recent Hessian resolution work. And so you have to consider noise for better reconstruction. Another one is CTF. So if you deal with like TEM, uh, bright field TEM image, you always have CTF. And I mentioned to you the phase is very important in phase, the Fourier space. But this C CTF function in high frequency, it rings like this. This creates big problem for the reconstruction. So for low, for low frequency information, so low resolution tomography for biological samples, when you work with like Scherzer defocus, you can make this extended a little bit, no, no ringing here. So up to this resolution, actually, you don't have, without worrying about CTF, you can get the reconstruction. But if you want very high resolution reconstruction from bright field TEM imaging, you have to really correct the CTF function. And symmetry. Actually, if you know the symmetry of your object, it can make your reconstruction better. And it can allow reconstruction with less number of projections. For example, this, for example, this is helical symmetry, helical like this, this orientation. This reconstruction is actually is done from single projection. From single projection, Using symmetry, you make a lot of copies from the single projection and attach them together to get the reconstruction. And this one. So from even without tilting, if you have very high symmetry, you can get good project, good reconstruction. Like helix or virus have a lot of like icosahedral symmetry or cubic nanoparticles. High symmetry objects give you like this. If you have like fourfold symmetry objects, if you measure only this quarter, then symmetry operation will automatically give you the other three. So you can minimize number of projection measures. And symmetry can be also one thing to consider to get better reconstruction. And tomorrow I will talk more about the stem tomography I'm working on. And there are a lot of limitations for achieving atomic resolution. And I will explain how we attack this problem and what will be the results. And this is uh, TEM school. And when I think about my school life, when there's school, there's always homework. And I made some homework for you. <laughs> and so I just gave some lecture, but lecture is usually not enough to completely understand the concept and everything. So this is to help you to actually soon do some hands-on work and get some feeling how this tomography reconstruction work. So when you go to this website, I posted this homework. And this homework actually requires MATLAB software and image processing toolbox. So if you have this one, you can try this one. If you don't have, yeah, unfortunately, this will not work. So I put very simple like questions, and I put very detailed 
take almost the answer. I gave almost the answer. So I think this will not take more than 30 minutes. And if you are like fast, within 15 minutes, you can finish everything. So if you have time, you can try and feel how this tomography works, how back projection works, how ESG works. Then you can, tomorrow I will explain more like exciting works and you can understand better what's actually happening. Okay, thank you very much for your attention. Uh, thank you, Ang. That's a really very good uh, presentation.